Hello and welcome to this Tuesday Spotlight, which Rosetta, within our wider theme of The Wall Speak, which is presenting the significance of the Rosetta Stone within the broader context of deciphering ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. So uh, thank you for joining us live in this uh, virtual Zoom room or on YouTube after the event itself. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, thank our supporters and members who enable us to continue promoting Egyptian cultural heritage in our events programme. So uh, please consider joining our community. Uh, you are why we're here today. <laughs> but if you are already a supporter, we are currently running a con Conserving the Collections appeal to protect our irreplaceable collections, uh, including two of our largest paintings, a portrait of our founder, Amelia Edwards, and the largest original watercolor by Howard Carter known. So links um, to finding out more about both of these uh, and supporting the EES will be available in the chat or description box. Thank you. But uh, moving on to our spotlight lecture, I am delighted to welcome our speaker today, Egyptian Egyptologist Heba Abdel Gawad, who is the project researcher for the AHRC funded project, Egypt's, Deper Sorry. Egypt's Dispersed Heritage, Views from Egypt at the Institute of Archaeology, UCL. She specializes in the history of Egyptian archaeology, focusing on the past and present Egyptian uh, perceptions and representations of the collection and distribution of archaeological finds from Egypt to the world. So thank you so much, Heba, for joining us. And the floor is yours. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Charlotte, for the invitation and for the EES. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I could tell from the chat that there are people from all over, even from Sinai. The introduction that I'll be giving today or the narrative that I'll be giving today is a narrative that is quite well known within Egypt. It's something that we get taught in our history curricula uh, at schools and universities growing up, which is the other, um, the counter history of uh, Rosetta, which I prefer for the purposes of today that we call it Rashid, which is the name of the city rather than um, the fine spot as Egyptology tends to dilute it uh, to. There is far more to Rashid than the stone. So the narrative that we, or that I'll be trying to introduce today, it's a counter narrative that goes against the one that we are usually introduced to. And uh, the main narrative that we have uh, on the Rosetta Stone, apart from the Egyptological uh, description or the Egyptological take on what is the Rosetta Stone and what should it mean um, to the field of Egyptology and to the world today, there is the narrative that is quite popular among the public, and it's mainly the one that has been uh, released with the history of the world in 100 objects from the BBC podcast that was uh, done by Neil McGregor, the former uh, director of uh, the British Museum. Why this podcast is important, first of all, it's a podcast and it's open access. It's widely available to everyone, and it seems to have the, um, uh, the official narrative or, the, or, or the, the official description of what the Rosetta is or what it should be. It gives us an impression that uh, Rosetta is simply the stone, one of the most, not one of the most famous, it is the most famous stone around the world, that is a fact. But uh, within the British Museum, be it on the labels or on the blog, we get told that the narrative offered to us or the description that is usually offered to us is the one that it has everything that we want to know about the Rosetta Stone. But I beg to differ and there is a counter narrative or a bit of a side, a story that has been sidelined or silenced uh, throughout the description that is usually given to us uh, surrounding the stone or Rosetta or Rashid, as I would prefer to call it today. We already, we're told that normally on the stone, we've got two languages. That is the ancient Egyptian language, be it in hieroglyphs, uh, in the hieroglyphic script or in the demotic script, and equally the Greek text as well. To give a very brief introduction to uh, the stone and the significance of the stone in ancient Egyptian history, for those of you who are not aware of it, um, at the time of the writing of uh, such stela or such stone, Egypt was under the rule of uh, the Ptolemaic dynasty. 
the Ptolemaic dynasty were Macedonian Greeks who took Egypt or who uh, became had Egypt as their property after one would say the division of the empire of Alexander the Great between his army his army leaders and Egypt became the prize of the Ptolemies the Greek Macedonian kings who ruled Egypt after the death or of Alexander the Great. What was happening uh, were the dynamics between the Egyptian local priests and the Ptolemaic kings, where there would be negotiations of powers happening nearly on a yearly basis, one would assume, that the priests would gather and have a, a collective meeting with the Ptolemaic court at the time. The meeting would be usually held in Alexandria, the capital of Egypt, where they would negotiate uh, the powers, how much um, how much power the court would give the Egyptian priests in terms of uh, keeping up their religious status, their economic status as well, and their political status within the Egyptian state too. And in return, um, the priests would provide the Greek Macedonian kings or the Ptolemaic kings at uh, the time with the approval of them to continue to rule um, over Egypt or to have Egypt as their wind prize or dynasty. This was, one would assume, an annual event happening throughout the Ptolemaic dynasty. And there was um, a declaration, an official uh, declaration that would have been a royal declaration that would have been written at the end of the meeting. And the orders would have been to have a stone written with the conclusion of the meeting in each and uh, distributed into each and every temple around Egypt. Usually, as Memphis was the religious center at the time and uh, the priests at Memphis had the most religious power over Egypt at the time, the script itself was written or the text itself, the decree itself would have been written in Memphis and then uh, transcriptions, copies of it would be distributed throughout all the temples around Egypt. We, we get to see that at the top of uh, the relief, the, the complete one, not the one that we have here, not the Rashid stone, but the usual text would have um, at the upper part, there would be a fragment where there would be a relief uh, representing the king giving offerings to the gods of the temples where the stone is allocated. And uh, the gods are giving back to the king approval of his uh, rule over Egypt and equally um, a divine status. After the relief, we would find two scripts, one in Egyptian that is divided into hieroglyphic script and demotic script, as well as the Greek text. In the example that we've got here, and I think this is one of, this is, this is why, this is why I think uh, in my own uh, professional and personal view, the stone could be distinctive in the sense of how it has an extra uh, layer of text here. That is the English text that we would have on the side of the Rosetta Stone that is quite uh, transcribed. I would find this um, an act of violence because this is an act declaring how the stone was won by the British army after the battle uh, or after uh, uh, the conflict that they were having with the French army in Egypt at Rashid or Rosetta as uh, the Western Eurocentric world would like to call it. And the British army has won the war, won the battle, and they were able to take every ransom that was taken by the French, that it became the property of the British army. And this includes the stone, which was discovered by one of the French uh, soldiers in 1799, who recognized the importance of the stone. And it was even declared uh, in the newspaper that was distributed among uh, the French troops that were residing in Egypt at the time that this discovery was made and it's an important discovery as such. And the British army by winning over uh, the French troops in um, Rashid, they managed to take over the stone. The stone was reused in one of, uh, it was a block that was reused uh, in, uh, in a building construction in the fort at uh, Rashid at the time. One would say the reuse or the recycling of blocks of stone is a habit that used to exist since ancient Egyptian times and continued throughout up till today, we were, where we find in some of the mosques reused blocks uh, from ancient Egyptian temples up till today. The distinction between the past and the present is usually very blurred uh, within Egypt. What happens here is that when 
after the stone was won by the British army, it was given as a gift to King uh, George III and to declare the moment or to mark uh, this, one would say, I wouldn't want to say a great discovery, but uh, this war spoil or the acquisition of such a war spoil, which is what the stone is today, it is a war spoil and it exists within the British Museum as uh, a war spoil as well. It states that it's captured in Egypt by the British Army in 1801 and presented by King George III. Again, a script, an extra layer uh, of text that is on the stone that is usually perceived or when, when it's referred to, it's referred to in the passing that this has just happened, that the British Army made, have made this inscription on uh, the side of the stone as if this is um, a peaceful act, but I would find it as um, an act of violence because if this has was reversed or if this had been um, a text that was written, one would assume in Arabic, be it by um, the colonial Ottoman power in Egypt at the time, it would have been perceived as an act of destruction of the stone. But given it's written by the British army gifted to the king, it's not perceived as such. Again, in the archive of the British uh, Museum, where we would find paintings uh, helping us to reimagine or to re-envision how Egypt looked at the time when the British army existed uh, or when the British army was residing in Egypt. I don't know what would be the perfect uh, description or the perfect definition to give of the, existing, of the existence of the British army within the Delta at the time, perhaps Alexandria and Rashid as well, which is referred to here as the city of Rosetta, because again, the painting gives us a very peaceful image of the situation um, of Egypt at the time. An image that could be very easily defied by the history of popular anti-colonial resistance that happened in Egypt or that existed in Egypt throughout uh, the British colonial um, period within Egypt, there has been more than one event where uh, anti-colonial resistance uh, has, re has reached its climax even far earlier than the 1919 revolution of Saad Zaghloul for the independence, which is far more uh, popular or perhaps far more well-known than the popular anti-colonial resistance. Rashid, in the Egyptian contemporary memory, one would say, uh, is far more known not only for the stone, but for the battle of Rashid. This was uh, the battle of the Egyptian anti-colonial resistance against the presence of the, the British troops who were attempting to invade uh, Rashid at the time in 1807 and um, with the aim of taking it as a military base, using the fact of how the Ottoman army, which is the other layer of colonialism that Egypt was uh, suffering from at the time, we need to remember that Egypt was ruled by uh, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, an Albanian, a non-Egyptian, who equally represented another colonial power over Egypt at the time. Egypt, in my professional and personal view, was double colonized at the time. The British army or the British troop took advantage of um, the political unrest that was existing uh, in Egypt at the time. And uh, they, with the aim of invading the north of Egypt and taking Rashid as a base, there was what we call the campaign of Fraser. It was a campaign uh, done by the British army led by the, the, the military leader, the British military leader Fraser at the time, which was met by a lot of local popular uh, resistance. This was, I wouldn't call it a military resistance because there were far more um, ordinary Egyptians in the battle or in the anti-colonial movement at the time, then there were then there were Egyptian uh, troops, and one could find that from the many paintings that document the moment that we can uh, find today at the Museum of Rashid or at the Military uh, Museum in Egypt at the Citadel of uh, Salah al-Din today in Cairo. And this is one of the paintings that document the moment, and it shows that how, while the British uh, troops looks in a military uh, attire, there would be the ordinary Egyptians in, nor in their normal clothing and the imbalance in power, given the weaponry that is used either by the Egyptians or by the British can tell us about uh, the absolute imbalance that existed between 
the British troops or the British presence in Egypt at the time and the situation within Egypt, be it military or um, economic or socio-political as well. The Battle of Rashid existed or it did happen in 1807, but it still exists up till today in the Egyptian contemporary memory. And this is how we perceive the so-called Rosetta or what I would prefer to call Rashid today. Our memory of Rashid is mainly not of the stone, but much with the battles and the anti-colonial uh, resistance, particularly the popular anti-colonial resistance that existed at the time. And Rashid is perceived one of the most important um, cities in Egypt that has been leading the anti-colonial uh, movement <clears throat> during the British uh, and equally the French or the Western colonial presence within Egypt at the time. We are reminded by uh, the modern Egyptian artist uh, Khaled Hinnu. Khaled Hinnu is an Egyptian artist who offered uh, perhaps a more contemporary take on the battle of Rashid that existed in 1807 because he wanted to highlight far more the, the contribution of the ordinary Egyptians, not only the ordinary Egyptians as in uh, the men or the mayor of the city, but equally the women, the children, the youth, who, whose contribution has helped so much in repelling the British army at the time and for the Egyptian side or for um, uh, the Egyptian local power, the ordinary Egyptians to win over the British army at uh, the time. Looking at the painting, focusing more on the painting again, he shows very much the power imbalance, but there is a lot of symbolism where we would see the British flag uh, up uh, like taken down while the Egyptian flag held by one of the Egyptian women joining the resistance movement being held up high again as a sign of victory. We would see equally the women and the local weaponry that they were used or the very traditional means of resistance that they were used. And this was not something that was only significant of Rashid, but that was usually the traditional way of resisting within Egypt at the time, particularly in rural Egypt where the mili Egyptian military presence or the Turkish military uh, presence at the time was not um, very was not very excessive. It was mainly in the centers, but in the rural areas where British troops or French troops were usually aiming to invade and use them as military bases, traditional uh, resistance as in uh, throwing water at the troops or throwing sand or uh, using throwing rocks by the children, be it uh, girls or boys, this was the ordinary means of resistance or even sticks or swords. This was the weaponry that was available to the people at the time. Why it is important for us to reflect on such incidents? Because usually the archaeological archives and usually the narrative offered to us uh, of these many so-called discoveries is a narrative uh, that is quite passive. It's a narrative that is quite peaceful. And it draws or detects colonialism in such peaceful light that uh, totally defects and distorts the reality. There were millions of lives lost. Um, this aside from the economic exploitation uh, and the, the, the exploitation of all the resources that existed at the time, but there, there was equally violence. There was a military presence. There were, there were troops on the ground. And there was more than one incidence where there were local battles where millions of Egyptian lives were lost in the process and equally memories, something that the archaeological archive tends um, to, one would say, dismiss, silence, or it's totally absent from the memory of Egyptian archaeology in Egypt. It usually refers to the exist these the archaeological activities that existed in Egypt at the time that they were existing in such peaceful uh, environment and passive where power was not as imbalanced as one would see in paintings like this that remind us or that reframes or reclaims the narrative once again of what, what it meant to have a colonial power on a local land and the impact it has on the local communities, not only on the exploitation of the country as such. The memories of the colonial presence uh, is still very clear within the city of Rashid. The city of Rashid uh, is one that, that perhaps one of my favorite cities in Egypt because it really depicts or it captures the multi-layers the multi and 
the multi-ethnicities that existed within Egypt at the time. But what is extremely interesting is how at the center we would find, we are usually reminded by um, the colonial existence with the stone in the middle. And this is the visual memory uh, of the stone. Obviously, the one we've got here is a replica of the stone. The actual stone exists, uh, still exists in the British Museum. This is a replica that was offered to Egypt. But the setting here is absolutely different than the setting that we would see at the British Museum. The display of the replica that we would find here is one that defies at least for myself, and it captures quite well the actual setting or the context from uh, of how the stone was extracted from Egypt at the time, far more than any display that the British Museum or any museum around the world would be uh, able to offer. This is this is us face to face with the realities of um, colonialism and how the stone was extracted from Egypt. Again, we are told of how uh, the Rosetta Stone is a valuable key for uh, cracking the codes of the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And we do owe a lot to the stone, Rashid, today, uh, for perhaps discovering ancient Egypt. That's a narrative that is very much adopted by the wider Western Eurocentric world, perhaps today in the attempts of Egyptology to look inwards and to defy the colonial history of the discipline itself. This is something that we tend to discuss more within academic settings, but within uh, the, pop the popular discourse, within the public and popular discourse, Champignon is still uh, the hero, is still the one who um, is widely or vividly remembered by and with the public when it comes to the the deciphering of the hieroglyphs and the cracking the codes of the hieroglyphs. We came to know by a research that was done by Aukesha Idali in 2004 and 2005, the lost millennium of uh, Egyptian, um, of ancient Egypt or of the contribution of Arab uh, and Egyptian scholars into the reclaiming or perhaps the reframing or the re-understanding or the reinvention of ancient Egypt, we do owe uh, Aukesh Abdali a lot when it comes to bringing us to a different narrative. So the first narrative that we have that usually surrounds the stone is the narrative of discovery. We are offered a very peaceful um, image of the discovery. And the second narrative is one of another D, which is the deciphering. Again, this is a Western European uh, deciphering or a collective European effort that uh, gave us or offered the world ancient Egypt or Egyptology. But Ibn Wahshiyya, he's made extensive efforts uh, in and many attempts in order to try to understand or try to come up with a way of uh, recognizing how one can be the sign. Did every sign represent a letter or did every sign represent a word? How, how was the hieroglyphs composed? One would we cannot claim that this was a complete effort, but it was far earlier uh, than Champollion. It dates back to 1791 in his uh, Kitab Shawku al Mustahem fi al And he was very much interested linguistically in trying to uh, decode many of the ancient scripts, and he had particular interest in hieroglyphs. The text uh, and uh, the manuscript of Ibn Wahshiyya, the original manuscript today, it resides in Paris, in the National Library in Paris, ironically. And it has been translated and published in London under the title of Ancient uh, Alphabets with Hieroglyphic Characters. Again, no excuse for Champignon or for Thomas Young or for uh, Egyptology at large to not recognize the valuable effort that was offered to us by Ibn Wahshiyya in his very early attempt to try to understand how the hieroglyphs operated or how uh, the ancient uh, script has uh, operated at the time. Again, we should not, we should not uh, claim that this is complete effort, but it was one of many extensive efforts and far earlier than uh, any Western or any European attempt to try and understand um, better the history and uh, heritage of Egypt at the time. These are a few uh, parts of the script, of the manuscript that was done by uh, Ibn Wahshiyya, his many attempts to try to retrieve 
the alphabet and the translation offered here. Again, one could see that this, not, this is not a complete effort, but it was uh, a very respectable attempt and one that was far earlier at the time when ancient Egypt was not yet at the radar of the Western world or of the European world. It was already at the radar of Ibn Ahshia, an Iraqi uh, scholar who's visited and lived in Egypt extensively and attempted to perhaps crack the code of what it meant to be an ancient Egyptian as a history or heritage. But today in our memory or the way the stone is represented today or the whole effort behind it is one of very French pride. And uh, this is a very controversial, I find these two modern depictions, modern French uh, reinventions of the stone, as well as the effort of deciphering quite uh, one would say controversial, but again, I would like to refer to them similarly to the, the Egyptian or to the, the, the English script that existed on the stone at the time, that they are equally violent. Such representation of Champollion with his, uh, with his feet, particularly his shoes over the head of an ancient Egyptian uh, colossal statue is quite offensive from an Egyptian perspective. It is understandable that there is a uh, the vis this visual representation within Greek and Roman culture and European culture, it has its own symbolism, but within an Egyptian culture, perhaps wider the Middle Eastern and North African culture, having one's shoes in one head is quite an offensive um, way of depicting uh, supremacy. And uh, this has been received with, this was made as a memorial of the efforts that were done by Champollion to decipher the hieroglyphs. But this was received with a wave of Egyptian criticism on social media. And one would say, again, a reminder of the Battle of Rashid. But this was far more recent um, in the past few years. And even recently, uh, in 2020 and from 2015 onwards, this has been received with a lot of criticism. And another one would say popular, modern, anti-colonial uh, resistance. I'm referring to this image as equally colonial because colonialism should be defined in, a, in wider terms than just having uh, troops on the ground or, just, or than just having Western presence on the ground or exploitation of resources because exploitation of knowledge and uh, cultural appropriation is equally another form of colonialism. So we need to rethink perhaps or to reflect on what we mean by colonialism. And once we have a, perhaps a wider, more emotional and cognitive definition of colonialism, we will be able to see that it's not a thing of the past. It's still up and running. And sadly, it's still part of our present today. Not only is the Rosetta a French pride when it comes to uh, Champollion and the, the history of the deciphering, of the stone, but it's equally a British pride. This is this became part of the British brand. Um, many come to visit the British Museum solely to visit the Rosetta Stone, and the branding that was created uh, behind the presence of the Rosetta Stone, you could find even socks uh, with the script of the Rosetta Stone. It became part of the British identity, the visual identity, but equally part of uh, the nation branding attempts of Britain. Again, this is cultural appropriation. This is another form of uh, colonialism that perhaps is not very similar to the colonialism that existed at the time when there were troops at the ground. But this, again, uh, the cultural appropriation and the exploitation in the sense of the economic profit that the British Museum is gaining from uh, such merchandise is another exploitation of a war spoil that exists within the museum today. And I do insist on it being a war spoil rather than reaching or being part of the collection of the British Museum legally. In recent years, up till, two, up till perhaps a few months ago in 2022, we had a replica of the, uh, of the stone, of the Rosetta Stone at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo together with uh, a bust of Champignon. And this could also be seen as an act one would assume of auto-colonialism, where we were we are equally 
adopting the colonial narrative. This photo was taken in uh, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo in 2018. Today, if you visit the Egyptian Museum in Cairo in 2022 and after uh, the transforming the Egyptian Museum in Cairo project, which the British Museum was part of, and it is the British Museum who was uh, partnering, partner, par partnering with the Egyptian Museum in Cairo with the curators um, in redisplaying the Greco-Roman galleries. And we would find here uh, the Canopus decree, which is actually the far more full and complete uh, version of the Rosetta Stone, because we need to remember that the Rosetta Stone is only part of a full decree. It's not even the full decree, but we have uh, the copies of the full de decrees and most of the copies of the full decrees that are similar to uh, the stone still exist at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo today. And if you want to see the decree in full, you have to come to Egypt and visit it at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo today, where it finally it's displayed in the way it should and it's taking the recognition it should, and uh, the replica of the Rosetta Stone, together with the bust of Champignon, have been taken out of display. Uh, again, this signals a movement of self-reflection within Egyptian Egyptology and uh, the rise in Egyptianizing, or perhaps in having more Egyptian agency over the narrative of uh, Egyptology. The other D that the stone is usually trapped in, so we have the discovery, the deciphering, but equally there is the current decolonization movement that is focused on repatriation and how the stone itself is trapped in repatriation. A disclaimer that I would like to make um, at the very beginning before I go forward is that repatriation, it is the right of the local communities. This is not to deny communities their right to repatriate uh, their objects and to return objects that have left their countries illegally. But one needs to remember that it is one of the forms of healing. This is not the sole form of healing. And we need to remember that the current international laws that govern repatriation makes it state to state. Local communities, um, it's very difficult for the local communities to have their own say or to be included in the decision making process of what should be returned, how it should be returned, and after its return, what should happen to it, how it should be uh, displayed. There is no uh, filtering of the people's opinion in the current repatriation movement. We also need to remember that the repatriation movement that we are witnessing today is very Western-centered, it's very museum-centered. It cares far more uh, for the objects rather than the communities. Again, it's not people-centered, it's Western Museum and object centered. And as I just mentioned, the way that the laws are governed today or the way that uh, the laws are surrounding repatriation are shaped today do not offer the social justice that repatriation is meant to achieve. And we need to remember that returning objects back to their home country is only one side of the story. There is, uh, this does not make up for the lives lost and the memories lost or for the brutality and atrocities that um, many of the previously colonized communities have suffered from or the violence that has occurred. But it is one of the many ways of reparations and healing and that the local communities or the people themselves who have been previously colonized should be at the center of this discussion. It has to be them and we need to find ways where the multivocality of those local communities could be included in the decision making uh, process. The problem that comes uh, with the Rosetta Stone or that comes with uh, the, the repatriation of the stone, it seems that uh, everyone seems to know what the Egyptians want, but no one tells us which Egypt are they talking about, which Egyptians uh, do they mean. And once uh, the object, let's say, be the Rosetta Stone or any other object, it's, uh, is returned to Egypt, what should happen to the object after its return to Egypt? Who gets to decide uh, what should happen to the objects and who should be involved in the decision making process of what should be returned, how and where it should be returned? This brings us to an incident, and this is part of a research that uh, I'm working on at the moment, and it should be published in the coming uh, few months. In, 2019, in 2009, we have the incidents of uh, Mohammed Ramadan, a lawyer uh, from Rashid, who filed a lawsuit um, in Egypt at the Egyptian court, 
uh, urging the Ministry of Antiquities to return uh, the stone from the British Museum, but for it to be returned, not to be placed at uh, the Grand Egyptian Museum uh, in Cairo, but to be placed in the city of Rashid. This is to give us a glimpse of the polarity of opinions and a glimpse of the multivocality that exists within Egypt and how by sending objects home, uh, this, is, this could be like um, a conscience clearance exercise rather than an act of true social justice if the multivocality of the local communities is not included or involved in the process. How and why this should happen? Again, this is for the local communities and this is for the wider Egyptians to discuss and uh, decide. But this is just a glimpse or an example of how there is a polarity of opinions and how that the discussions within Egypt are far more particular and are far more local and are far more specific and emotional and cognitive than they are uh, than they are compared to the discussions of repatriation that are currently happening within Western academia or the Western discourse, perhaps equally the Western media in general. The lawsuit was denied and the Egyptian court did refuse uh, Mahmoud's case, stating that there is that no law exists that abides or that forces the Ministry of Antiquities to make claims to repatriate the objects. It has to be the decision of uh, the Ministry of Antiquities together with the committees that exist within the ministry to decide if certain objects should be returned and how they should be returned, where and why. Again, um, repatriation in this case wouldn't have been a, a repatriation to the people given there is a fraction of the people, be it a minority or a majority, back to differ or do have uh, a different opinion than the one dominating uh, than the one dominating the actual socio-political scene. In this respect, decolonization uh, from this perspective, it is just an act of simple return without reflecting on who should the object be returned to, who gets to decide and what should happen to the objects after its return, would not achieve the social justice that acts of repatriation should be aiming for. Repatriation um, can in certain situations or in certain parts of the world or at certain given moments could lead to repression or to recolonialism if not done properly, if not people-centered, and if not including and involving the multivocality, both in the decision-making process and the wider process of return. A project that we've been uh, working on, again, this is part of the research that should be uh, published quite soon, that I've been working on with the comic artist Nasser, was the fact of how uh, usually when the British Museum tends to post on social media whenever there is uh, an event or whenever there is any celebration where Rashid Stone uh, is concerned with, there would be a lot of social media posts taking place. And Egyptians, interestingly, usually tend to respond uh, to these social media posts. So they are actively interacting. They are actively stating their opinion. And they are actively part of uh, the current academic discussions that are taking place, but yet no one seems to be uh, interested in either documenting such opinions given social media with its flows. But again, it's a way of, and it's an open flat platform that offers uh, the people an opportunity to respond back to any institutional post coming from any museum. So it's a perfect opportunity for uh, to open a dialogue, but usually, the commentaries that are made by um, the Egyptians on posts regarding uh, the Rosetta Stone are usually dismissed. This is not only the case uh, with the British Museum, this is the case with all and every uh, museum around the world, usually responses coming from communities, particularly if they are local communities of previously um, uh, colonized um, communities or when it comes to objects that have been extracted during colonial times commentaries coming from the local communities on social media tends to be dismissed, um, unresponded to. One reason could be that they usually use their own local language in responding uh, to such posts. And again, having, uh, having the posts, having the responses in Egyptian Arabic would make them inaccessible 
for uh, the social media teams in the Western Museum, of course. This is, it's not an excuse in my own opinion, but it's a way for us to, to reflect on how there has to be a need to diversify uh, the teams working within uh, Western museums. And there has to be some sort of institutional change, not only from a curatorial perspective, but equally in something that is very important and very relevant as in uh, the social media teams. So I've been working uh, on collecting the responses that the local Egyptian communities make to uh, any British museum post uh, on uh, the Rosetta Stone. And the responses are equally uh, quite interesting and uh, they are quite uh, thought provoking for me. And I think they should be for the wider uh, field of Egyptology or for the wider museum practice because responses come from ordinary people. They know that Champignon is not the first to decipher it. Uh, London's thieves stole it. This is the actual wording used by one Facebook user. It's stolen even if it's kept safe. Again, this goes against the narrative that it's far better displayed uh, in Western museums, a narrative that is usually propagated when it comes to objects that um, are displayed in Western museums that left certain communities within a colonial context. Also, there is uh, the commentary made by someone, obviously from Rashid, saying we need it at Rashid. Someone else saying, what is, what is it doing in London, for God's sake? So the responses here, obviously, they should not be representative of the hundred millions of Egyptians, but they are representative of a, a good fraction of the community, and they should be the beginning of an interactive dialogue that one should be having, uh, not only when it comes to the stone and the legalities of its presence, be it in the British Museum or the legalities of its presence in the field of Egyptology itself. Uh, it is important for us to engage and to reflect on such uh, dialogues, regardless of how uh, representative they are. Although one has to say that when it comes to Egypt and the use of social media, Egypt is perceived as one of um, uh, one of the leading countries in the use of social media from a multi-vocal point of view, that the demography of the Egyptians use, using social media is quite representative of uh, the wider Egyptian social uh, demography, economic and equally uh, the various age groups. So it, it could be seen as a representative of the public opinion in Egypt, and it does have an impact in shaping the socio-political uh, conditions within Egypt itself, not only uh, during the 2011 political events, but up till today, it does have this power. Um, the, the takeaway message, the very simple takeaway message that I was hoping for us to reflect on today is going through the three Ds, we need to reflect that the discovery was not as simple as it is usually framed within Egyptological narratives. The deciphering was not only a European effort, there has been extensive earlier Arab and Egyptian effort to decipher the hieroglyphs and um, remembering these efforts today within the academic discourse has to be complemented with equal uh, recognition of such efforts within the wider public discourse. And finally, in the fact, in the third D, which is the decolonization, how um, there is so much there is so much claims uh, by the names of the Egyptians that do not necessarily represent all Egyptians. And we need to reflect that Egypt, like any country around the world, exists in a multivocality. It's it consists of a multiplicity of views, multiplicity of voices that all should be taken in consideration when it comes to any decision making uh, or even the production of knowledge, be it related to an act of repatriation or simple uh, decision making of what should happen to heritage, be it in a museum or elsewhere. Um, one project that I would like to flag up, which uh, was the spark of my own research project for, to reclaim the Rosetta or to create a counter narrative for the Rosetta is the 100 histories of 100 worlds in one object. And this is their website because uh, working with a variety of local contributors from local communities, they are working in creating a counter narrative to the one that exists in the hundred uh, in the hundred words in in hundred objects podcast that was made and released by the British Museum. It's a counter narrative that is 
important, worth checking, and it can open up our eyes to how uh, an object would have a multiplicity, not only of voices surrounding it, but a multiplicity of stories. And there shouldn't be one story leading any single object. And thank you so much. Thank you again, uh, Heba Abdel Gouad, for such a positive and inspiring uh, spotlight lecture on the narratives uh, from modern Egypt on uh, Rashid, as we should now call it. <laughs> so, so thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, hopefully we will see you at a future EES event. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.